Great. So we're just past the top of the hour. So I think we can go ahead and get started. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. A warm welcome on behalf of the Boost team to our Bright Spots webinar featuring the story, The March Towards Resilience and Ready Readiness, uh, which was submitted on behalf of the Selena Center for International Development and Research team. Um, before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping slides. So we'll be using a Zoom meeting format today um, so that we ask that you remain muted to minimize any background noise. Um, you can always raise your hand during the presentation to speak um, or use the chat box to submit questions, make a comment or respond to other participants. Um, now would be a great time to introduce yourselves, uh, tell us your name and where you're joining us from. Um, and thanks uh, for those that have already put their, their name um, and location in the chat box. So for those who might be joining us for the first time, the Boost community is a diverse network of more than 1,600 immunization professionals from over 130 countries. Uh, through our online platform, boostcommunity.org, we offer opportunities for our community to connect with peers, strengthen leadership and advocacy skills, and grow in their careers. Um, and just a note that we will be uh, storing today's session recording and slides in the resource library of the Boost Bright Spots Learning Group. Um, so definitely be sure to log into the Boost platform and join that learning group. Um, a little bit more about uh, the Bright Spot series. So Bright Spots are stories that shine a light on work that's happening on the ground and inspire immunization professionals everywhere to learn, adapt, and take action in their own communities. Uh, from engaging religious leaders in the community to including, improving supply chain delivery to reach the last mile, there is innovation occurring at all levels in the system. Our second round of Bright Spots, which was announced a couple months ago, uh, includes 10 stories from six countries. Uh, we're about to release the final set of stories in that round um, in the coming week. Uh, so definitely check out the Bright Spots microsite, which is brightspots.boostcommunity.org. Um, through this live series, Boost offers an opportunity for our members to hear directly from Bright Spots story submitters to better understand their challenger program and how they achieved success. So with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the speakers uh, for today's session. We have Dr. T uh, Tijiani uh, Husani, who's a seasoned public health professional and the executive S secretary of Kano State Primary Healthcare Management Board uh, with vast experience in health system strengthening to deliver improved health results. We're also joined by Dr. Rihanna Ibrahim, uh, who's a trained medical professional and experienced public health specialist who anchors the implementation, capacity building, and documentation management aspects of SIDAR's immunization work in northern Nigerian states. Um, and finally, we're also joined by Dr. Lucky Abraham, who's a trained medical professional and seasoned management consultant who leads SIDAR's work in vaccine supply ch uh, chain in Kano State. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Rihanna and actually stop staring, uh, sharing my screen as well. Thank you very much, Liz, um, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Rehana, as um, you've mentioned, and um, I work for CEDAR, I'm a manager in CEDAR and anchor CEDAR's um, immunization work in six Northern Nigerian states, um, one of which is Kanu State. Um, today, we're gonna to be sharing our experience working with the state government to revamp the routine immunization system, specifically speaking to the vaccine supply chain infrastructure revamp that we supported the state to do. Um, the objectives of this session, um, while the slide comes up, are really two. First is sharing the experiences of that revamp that I described um, and highlighting how that system has stood the test of time and com continues to demonstrate resilience and efficiency, um, how it has been adapted for COVID-19 um, vaccine rollout and COVID-19 response activities. And secondly, we'll be sharing some of the lessons that we've learned on that very interesting journey, um, understanding that this has been evolving work from um, polio support to routine immunization system strengthening and then to broader PHC um, and COVID-19 now um, response 
um, the systems have been leveraged and built upon in that very interesting manner. And there has been a lot of lessons that um, Kano State and in fact, Nigeria, Northern Nigeria has learned from that um, in terms of immunization programming. Um, and so we're going to be doing this um, in five sections, um, I will really just be introducing the background of the story of where we're coming from and painting that picture of what immunization looks like um, in Northern Nigeria. Um, and starting from slide 10, I will be describing um, a story that I'm sure that we are all familiar with in our different contexts, especially in low to middle income countries. Um, a woman who lives in a community which is a bit of a distance from her settlement of residents, um, who doesn't really know much about immunization, but you know, meets someone who triggers that um, initial response and tells her, you know, you can go to the facility and get immunized, get your kid immunized and prevent this deadly disease that paralyzes children. And you know, she eventually gets home. Typically in Northern Nigeria, she has to negotiate this with her husband and she's having to convince him after hours of back and forth, he finally provides that consent for her to go to the facility. And you know, she has to wait for the next session day, which is a Tuesday. And she gets there and there's a long queue. And before it gets to her turn, they're out of vaccines. She's told to come back the next Tuesday to have the um, vaccines um, for her kid. And then successfully, somehow, she makes it the second time around the long distance and the negotiation at home and gets there. And this time, the session does not hold at all. And there was no communication of that. And she gets home. And of course, that consent is not something that continues to readily come up anymore. And she does miss that opportunity. There are thousands of women in Kano, and especially before 2012, who missed opportunities like this and had consequences on their demand or, or on the organic demand for immunization because of these supply chain challenges. So we're going to start this conversation with this context in mind of what Kano was about a decade ago before all of the system strengthening interventions that were rolled out. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick poll. Um, on the next slide, you should see a pop-up on your screen anytime now. Um, yes, that's come up right now. Um, what are the consequences of vaccine supply chain system failures on vaccine demand in your context, especially to the individual caregivers or the community? Um, please vote your responses in that for the first question. We're gonna take a few minutes to do that. Um, and the second question, what are the commonest reasons for low immunization coverage in your locality, in your experience? Um, you may select multiple answers to this. Oh, great, we can already see some results coming in. Oh, fantastic, interesting results too. Um, majority of everyone agrees that supply chain um, constraints often translate to vaccine hesitancy or contribute to um, reduced vaccine demand. Um, we can also see that the, there are challenges that plague immunization coverage. And um, we're seeing that some of these are supply and demand side issues, which are very common. But we also understand that the first mile is always getting that supply side system solved. And since we're all agreed that this is something, unavailability of vaccines is a constraint that we see, and not just in immunization, but in supply chains everywhere, it's very important for us to document and, and share this very interesting story from Kano. Um, and now I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Tijani Husseini, the Executive Secretary of the Kano State Primary Healthcare Board, um, who has worked in the health system strengthening journey of Kano for almost a decade now and will be taking us through that journey, starting from slide 12. Over to you, Dr. Tijani. Thank you. And so, Carlo State, as some of us may be aware, was the epicenter of wild polio virus transmission in Nigeria. And as at 2021, we have about 600,000 
on Darwin children and only 1,089 1, facilities across 484 wards uh, in 44 local government areas of Kano. The state experienced major failures in immunization supply chain system at the time with only one functional walk-in code room, 17 functional solar direct drive refrigerators at health facilities uh, for storage of vaccines, and only 52 facilities receiving vaccine as at that time across Kano. As a result of this, the state recorded poor immunization outcomes. Only 22% of the eligible population was immunized for Penta 3, and about 450,000 of the 600,000 on Darwin in the state were not fully vaccinated. Kano also recorded average monthly stock out of 43% during this period. The deplorable condition of the supply chain in the midst of WPV eradication sparked the need to revitalize the RI supply chain system in order to boost access to immunization services. And this was supported by SCIDA team. Moving to slide 14. In order to maintain better understanding the supply side issues and to deliver and to be able to profile some appropriate recommendations, the team commissioned a diagnostic of the RI system. This revealed a number of bottlenecks, which included an inefficient vaccine delivery architecture, which was crippled by insufficient funding for supply chain infrastructural development, poor maintenance of existing CCEs, as well as a weak and unfunded poor system of vaccine delivery. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Ali Kwatangwata Foundation saw a unique opportunity to partner with the state government for improved immunization uptake. And so the two foundations worked with the state to establish a shared funding partnership between the state, BMGF, and ADF. Funds from this partnership was leveraged for front-loading infrastructural procurement establishment of plant preventive maintenance system for all cold chain equipment and the redesign of the vaccine delivery system from cold system to a, to a funded push system. The second bottleneck was the team, which the team identified was inadequate coordination of the supply chain system resulting from absence of a dedicated coordination body to oversee the execution of the key vaccine supply chain activities. This presented an opportunity to institutionalize the state logistic working group for monitoring and coordination of supply chain activities at all levels. Lastly, the supply chain system was observed to be plagued by poor data management system. Specifically, there, there were absence of tracking tools and reporting structures with limited visibility into the supply chain system and ultimately impeded the ability to make informed decisions and propose solutions to address gaps. This highlighted the need for the development and deployment of relevant stock management documentation and analytic tools for use at all levels. Slide 15. These identified gaps and opportunities for optimization served as a guide to redesign the direct vaccine delivery architecture. The team rolled out five key interventions, which included one, establishment of the logistic working group. This working group garnered participation from the state supply chain team and partner representation and was tasked with coordinating all supply chain activities in the state. Procurement and installation of work in court rooms at the state and zonal cold stores and solar direct drives at LG stores and health facilities. The procurement process was adequately supported by the state logistic working group with funding pulled from MOU basket from the partnership between the foundations and Kano state government. Rolled out of visual SOPs to guide the general op operationalization of the supply chain work. And lastly, a redesign of the vaccine delivery architecture. This redesign involved a change from an unfunded food delivery system to a funded push del direct delivery system. Through this model, vaccines were now pushed from zonal cold stores directly to 
LGA coal stores and equipped health facilities across all the 44 local government areas of Kano State. The additional health facility equipment which was projected as well as the walk-in courtrooms facilitated the implementation of this model. Slide 16. This direct delivery of vaccine from zonal coal store to health facilities involve a number of activities which are detailed on slide 16, and this include one, the conduct of a planning meeting by the state logistic working group to align on direct vaccine delivery dates, allocate vaccines to zones and their respective health facilities, and to review the readiness of the delivery fleet and team to commence deliveries. Two, we have sorted, we have sorted a marking of all allocated vaccines for the zones. And three, we have the actual delivery of allocated vaccine to health facilities, which was led by a third party logistician. And now this activity has been transitioned to the state in source delivery team. During deliveries, the de delivery team collects and validates vaccine consumption and utilization data, which is analyzed at the zonal and state levels and utilized, and utilized to make informed decision on the immunization program. Lastly, we have the post-delivery assessment, which is conducted by a zonal logistics team at, at the end of each delivery, direct vaccine delivery round. Overall, the direct vaccine delivery system was, has resulted in significant cost savings and improved capacity of the state logistic team, especially with the transition to in-source deliveries with technical support from 3PLs and other experts. I will hand over to Lucky to run us through some of the gains that we have recorded on this intervention thus far. All right, thank you, Dr. Tijani. Uh, on slide 18, we will see some highlights of the gains that we have recorded in Kano uh, following the institution of the direct vaccine delivery. So um, our intervention so far has facilitated the upgrade of the coal chain system in Kano State. Uh, previously, we had only one walk-in cold room, but now there are eight walk-in cold rooms across the state and zonal um, cold stores. There are also 439 functional SDGs, which are located at health facilities. With all these um, CCEs um, having comprehensive preventive and corrective maintenance plans. Our vaccine availability has also improved from an average of 57% in the past to 99% currently and all this with 100% timely delivery. There has also been an increase in the number of equipped health facilities in the state from an initial 17 to 497 health facilities, which has facilitated our direct delivery of vaccines to these health facilities. Now these immediate results have contributed ultimately to our improved vaccine availability across service delivery points, which has led to improved vaccination coverage at a sustainable cost as we can see by the change in cost from um, over $371,000 to our current $18,000. Now, according to the 2018 National Demographic and Health Survey, um, Kano has recorded 46% PENTA-3 coverage. Now, this is also anticipated to improve further with the release of recent results, as we can see, this is about three years ago. But with the recent, with the result that we expect this year, it will be far better. Now on slide 19, we can see that we've used the same system uh, for the delivery of other essential commodities. This includes um, immunization data tools and child health cards, which are essential in tracking the general health of children. These are delivered at no cost and their availability is also tracked at all primary healthcare facilities across the state. Uh, system has also been leveraged for polio vaccine, um, which are uh, delivered and stored for, uh, which are stored and delivered for campaigns, which include SIAs and OBR campaigns. Now, this has also led to the eradication of wild polio vaccine in Kano State and in extension the Nigeria as a country. It was also leveraged for the COVID-19 response on the onset of the pandemic with over 400,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccines stored and distributed using this infrastructure. Now, the utilization for COVID-19 relief is worth diving into a little deeper. I will do that on slide 20 where we can see the application of the system for COVID-19 response. Now it's 
all began it last year in 2020 during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Kano State had the second highest number of COVID-19 cases in the country, with health workers making over 16% of the cases that were recorded. The entire state was locked down. PPEs, including face masks, hand sanitizers, were all scarce com commodities, and pharmacies had run out of all this. Healthcare workers and community fears, um, fears of getting infected also led to a decrease in uh, PHC service uptake. So um, our solution was to leverage the DVD system for quantification and transportation by available PPE to healthcare workers based on their needs. And over 250,000 PPEs were delivered to health facilities and the impact was felt shortly after. The proportion of health workers who made up new cases of COVID-19 infection reduced drastically to less than 1% by June of 2021. Interrupted services were also restored as the DVD system proved itself to be resilient despite the pandemic and associated collapse of systems by taking on additional responsibility. So at this juncture, I will be handing over back to the executive secretary who will continue with the challenges and key uh, lessons that have been learned so far. Over. Thank you, Dr. Lucky. As with any health care system strengthening effort, the team encountered challenges while implementing the intervention, and this was circumvented through increased collaboration and synergy with state, zonal, and LG logistic officers and partners, buy-in and leadership of the SBSMB, and continuous capacity building of key program officers. Some of these specific challenges included inadequate capacity of program officers, poor visibility into vaccine management at cascade health facilities, chain in management and outsourced to in-source PPM, and lastly, theft of solar panels. On slide 23, we may have supply chain professionals in the audience who would love to learn how to implement a similar intervention. For such people, we would recommend a few principles. Obtain the buy-in of the leadership of the state health team. Ensure the team is led by a driven and committed logistic officer. Build the capacity of local level logistic officers to be able to make informed decisions and effectively coordinate activities at their own levels. Utilize simple data tools and SOPs to guide implementation of the work stream. Ensure real-time review of the direct vaccine delivery data. And lastly, support collaboration with while keeping the team spirit high. Thank you all for listening. We will post links to the resource materials in the chat box as we take the Q&A now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tijani. Um, this is Rehana. Um, so we have detailed some of the lessons we've learned and the experience on revamping the supply chain infrastructure in Kano. Um, we've described how we've been able to um, set up a governance structure through the SLWG. Um, we've described how we have supported the states to equip um, Apex Health facilities um, in each ward, in each political ward in the state um, with um, cold chain equipment. We've also talked about how we've designed or redesigned the delivery architecture to a straight to facility from the state to health facility um, delivery system that is direct and that has been built over time to be more efficient and very resilient and has been now adapted for um, use in other PHC services, for use in polio, for use more importantly or more relevantly in COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And um, this, this attests to all of that, the impact of the investments that have gone in um, over the last decade. Um, so we would really like to get questions um, in the chat. Um, we've also posted some material in the chat as well, um, showing how the 
MOU um, system was used as a funding mechanism for immunization system strengthening. Um, and in that, we will also find the vaccine supply chain revamp um, and that experience from there. So please um, send in your questions and your comments. I'm handing back to Liz now, over. Great, thanks so much uh, for that excellent presentation. Um, like Rayana said, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat. Um, we also, if you'd like to raise your hand, you can voice over your questions too. Um, I see a few familiar names in the audience and also some fellow Bright Spot submitters. Um, so we definitely welcome your questions. Um, and looks like we have a question from Ada here. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, feel free to ask your question. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, well done, Kano team. Uh, Kano is one of the states in Northwest that we are copying in terms of immunization activities. Uh, what I want to ask Kano, maybe they can help share with us, uh, what role do communities play in this vaccine distribution and other immunization activities in their areas? Because when you look at your uh, the, uh, the SMS dashboard on the National Primary Care Development Agency and the LQS results, Kano is always topping. So those tips so that other countries or other states can copy and boost their immunization coverage. Thank you very much, over. Tijani, would you like to respond to that while we um, check for the other questions? Uh, yes. Um, communities play an important role in the entire immunization system, especially in Kano. And for the uh, vaccine supply chain, uh, the communities, uh, while we are installing, if you recall that we had only 57 SDDs in Kano, but over time we are we covered most of Kano with SDDs. Uh, so uh, communities were kind of entrusted with the protection of the SDDs themselves, the solar panels, because they are easy to, uh, to, to be stolen uh, and, and also the, the SDD to be vandalized. So it was kind of handed over to them for protection for security. That made them to feel they are part of the system and also that facility and the equipment are their own. So this is one important part of communities play. Uh, additionally, uh, we also had um, a direct relationship with them in reconciliation meeting. Uh, community leaders, uh, health facility staff sit on regular basis uh, to, to, to reconcile data to reconcile drop out and, to, and also to get people who have dropped out uh, from routine immunization. And because of that reconciliation meeting, uh, our, opt, uh, our SMS coverage was high. Uh, the vaccine, again, uh, uptake was high in Kano State. So these are some of those things communities play a role. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tijani. Also to add that the communities also um, participate actively in micro planning um, and also in actual identification of el eligible children for immunization, default tracking and making sure that they actually go. But for immunization specifically, they've done a lot in helping to secure the solar panels and the equipment in their communities, in the health facilities in their communities. So um, MOUs have been signed in time with some of the community leaders to ensure that um, they secure the equipment as well. Um, they also help as well with ensuring that um, vaccines are available and flag when there are issues with supply in their catchment facilities. Um, Dr. Tijani, there's another question here in the chat um, from Antonia Dingley, um, who says, um, can you tell us more about the data collection system that is now in place for Kano for COVID vaccines? What data is being collected and how? Is this available for other programs to use? Yes, um, for COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we are using the national system. Uh, so 
the data being collected is what the national requirements are. However, we have not discarded the EVD, that is the direct reporting supply. We use the same architecture uh, to collect data from health facilities where this immunization happened, uh, to the LGS where collation is made, uh, to the zonal level where also collation of uh, respective uh, LGS then to state level. Uh, so this is how the data is being collected at the moment. Um, for the long-term financing and maintenance of the direct delivery approach, already the state government has taken over uh, the financing of the DVD in Kano. Uh, and this happened since uh, 2016, if um, yes, it's since 2016. And it has been continuing uh, and without any hitch. And so we hope to continue with this uh, with active engagement of relevant stakeholders, especially at the highest level of government. Yes. Thank you. Does someone have a question? Okay, there's another question in the chat, I think. Or oh, was there someone that wanted to speak, Liz? Yeah, I think there's a couple of people with their um, hands raised. So um, I don't know if Ahmed, if you want to unmute and share your question. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ahmed Naveed Nusrat. I am speaking from Pakistan. I am working in immunization activities from more than 10 years. My question is that, that in Pakistan, we are suffering, uh, still we are suffering and facing a challenge to cover up the high risk mobile population. In high risk mo mobile population, there are a number of groups, especially the nomadic population and the brickline population. So still we have not able to develop a database for them because they change their location unpredictably and time to time. And we have not any cell number and any permanent address of them. Sometimes they move from another district and sometimes they move to another province. So uh, they are specifically a virus container for us and very uh, underserved population. So I want to uh, let them know what kind of uh, things, uh, actions we can take uh, that we may communicate to uh, other district or province and how, we, how can we uh, develop a data of that specific population so that they everly uh, vaccinated with immunization and their females are also vaccination, vaccinated for the TT vaccine. This is my question, thank you so much. So uh, thank you. Um, I will take um, several questions from the chat box and also I will answer uh, Ahmed Navid's uh, question. Uh, so for maintenance of the, um, the DVD, uh, we've instituted uh, what we call the floating assembly. Uh, floating assembly is an internal maintenance unit that now serviced um, our facilities, our equipment, uh, all over Kano. And initially we uh, have a, a third party who does that, but uh, with the establishment of this floating assembly, uh, in-house in maintenance unit uh, do that function. And this has reduced cost uh, on, on the part of the state parameter of care management board. Uh, last, um, again, on the chat box, um, how are we able to overcome uh, the challenges of mothers bringing their children to the health facility for immunization. Uh, several interventions were done. Um, we had, we engaged communities uh, through the community engagement mechanism at the SPSMB level uh, that um, do um, mobilization of women to come to the facilities. And also we instituted um, outreach sessions in some, of this, in some of these communities that are too far away from facilities. 
this has resulted in increased uptake uh, of um, immunization of these children under the age of um, one. Uh, the last question by Ahmed, we, he said, how do you do that? Uh, what we have done over a period of time is collaborate with traditional leaders of, in those communities. Uh, for example, they do like listen up on that one and they identify all on the newborn in their own communities. They also do like listing and also they reconcile who comes to take up vaccination. Uh, they sort that out and those who did not come, then they are followed up to ensure that uh, they come for vaccination. And for highly mobile, the same approach was done. Uh, we collaborated with the traditional leaders in those communities, uh, census of this on, on that one were taken and also a follow up was made through this traditional institution because they know uh, whoever is in their own communities that had improved greatly um, utilization and uptake of vaccination of routine immunization in Kano. Um, another question with COVID pandemic being that high in Kano State, how are you able to ensure that people are convinced to accept the polio vaccine and to bring uh, and, and, to, uh, and to COVID vaccines? Um, we were able to, through our social mobilization and also ensuring that our facilities are open, we're able to get um, uh, people to understand that they need to continue to get vaccinated uh, so that they are not vulnerable to polio again. And uh, this goes on pari pasu, uh, side by side with the um, COVID um, community outreaches we are doing. And that brought synergy to both for, for both COVID and also the polio immunization. Uh, did we face security challenges and insurgency? If you did, what lesson can you share for strengthening vaccine delivery and, uh, and vaccine infrastructure in areas with unstable security? Yes, um, Kano had pockets of uh, insecurities uh, across uh, three, four LGs of the 44 local government areas. So we collaborated with um, local vigilante, local security. Uh, sometimes they are the ones that take those uh, vigilantes take vaccines, uh, do the delivery of vaccine to the last mile. So that since they are familiar with the areas, our third party and uh, also our insource team might not be able to reach such areas. So we collaborated with them and at, at times they take uh, these um, vaccines to the last mile. And this is how we were able to approach some of these issues and uh, others can also copy that. Thank you very much, Dr. Tijani. I think we've answered a number of the questions that we have here. There's another question on financial sustainability. Um, I think um, the ES had answered this before, but just to add also that um, this initial investment of this was facilitated or catalyzed by the partnership between the state government, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Aliko Dangote Foundations. But that was designed in such a way that the state government could take over full funding of the immunization program. Um, and over the last three years, the Kano state government has been fully responsible for the vaccine supply chain operations um, of its um, own program solely. Um, it has also started to fund um, huge pieces of its primary health care program. However, um, understanding that um, supply chain systems go beyond the operational costs, um, infrastructure maintenance and, and or replacements um, will always um, come to bear in front. And what the state continues to do is leverage the different funding streams um, that continue to come into it. Um, understanding that that starts from government funding sources. So first of all, primary health care is resourced um, through the state's health budget. So aligning the state operational plan or state primary health care program plans um, with the state health budget is one of those. Um, secondly, ensuring that... <clears throat> 
funding pools like the basic healthcare provision funds um, are well qualified for and received, and those can fund some of the operational pieces um, of supply chain, even as it expands. Um, and then we also have the continuous um, use of more innovative ways to continually make sure that the financial burden is not a lot. Um, so as we've used this system for COVID, use it for polio and used it for other dry commodities or data tools, um, continuous leverage and thinking through how to continually make this um, efficient is one of the ways that sustainability is also guaranteed. And um, so far, so good um, with, with, with the plans that are in place. Um, <laughs> Um, I think there's another question. MJ, I don't know if we have time um, for more questions. Can you confirm, um, or oh, Liz? Yes, um, we have time for a couple more questions. And I think we also have a hand raised as well. I don't know if we want to start there. Um, All right. Obed, did you want to voice over your question? If you want to un unmute. Okay, um, yes, um, thank you very much. Um, so um, my name is um, Obed Bakam Philip. Um, I am a immunization supply chain consultant with UNICEF. So I've worked closely with Kano here in Nigeria, and um, I would say um, Kano is one of those bright spots for us in the country when it comes to immunization supply chain, especially in journey towards uh, maturity of the supply chain, you know, to that sustainable point. And um, so uh, my question here is, um, over time, you know, um, there have been a lot of TA support um, coming from um, different um, funding sources, you know, towards um, strengthening of the immunization supply chain, you know, to improve its performance and, uh, and ensuring uh, that it contributes towards um, the whole objective of um, improved coverage and equity and um, other, um, <coughs> um, Target. So, um, so over time, with all these um, TAs that have come and, and, and that the states have been able to benefit from, I will just want to know if uh, maybe the leadership will share with us uh, how the state have been able to um, optimize um, this um, uh, um, TA support and you know other support coming in from um, different partners. You know, as we can see with. Um, the result, which is there for everybody to see with this presentation today, how the state have been able to coordinate on these various supports that have come in. You know, over time, some of the lessons we've learned from different business uh, as well documented is uh, you find where there have been a lot of um, maybe TAs and different support coming towards um, strengthening of transition supply chain, but um, the impact has not really been felt. But for Kanu here, we can see a lot has been achieved with all this, though there is still a journey, you know, towards um, that uh, maturity of um, the supply chain, towards that sustainable level, which the indices and the markets are there for us to see that Kano State is rightly on that journey, on that path towards achieving it. So um, it will really help us here. And um, I think people here, even in Nigeria from other parts of the country, and especially people that are not in Nigeria, to know how states have been able to take leadership and um, coordinate um, all the support to ensure that um, the desired impact is achieved. Thank you and over. Thank you very much for that um, question, um, Dr. Tijani. I think the question was related to how Kano intends to use all of the available TA resources to kind of um, further strengthen the supply chain system, but also thinking through how the states can do more of, I mean, its own driving its own um, development in that manner. I hope I was able to synthesize that question correctly. Yes. Forgive me if I missed out some parts. Thank you. Um, how we optimize the TA uh, support we received um, several steps. Uh, one, initially there was no dedicated person that pushes for logistics. 
uh, and Kano was able to have a dedicated logistic officer for uh, vaccines. That helped a lot, uh, so that any TA that comes to Kano passes through him. As uh, that passes through him, he also gets synthesized uh, whatever support that uh, that 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 supports uh, build his capacity over a period of time, uh, and he drives uh, the um, whole direct vaccine delivery uh, structure uh, from the SPSMB perspective. Uh, secondly, uh, we also had, if you recall back, uh, that we instituted a logistic working group that serves as the house where most of the deliberation happens, how uh, the follow-ups, the monitoring uh, of the vaccine, direct vaccine delivery um, to, 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 to LGAs and to facilities. Uh, that again, um, with the interaction of the TA support coming from partners, they are also able to mature. Uh, since 2012, the state um, had a logistic working group and by this time around, it is sufficiently matured to handle most of the logistic issues, vaccine delivery issues in Kano State. Uh, that greatly helped. And uh, lastly, we were able to institute the floating assembly, the internal maintenance unit, that again facilitates us uh, coming to this level. And all these interventions and all these pieces uh, brought Kano to the level it is over. And there is also a question that says, we know Kano have a very large landmass with poor road network in some places. How are we able to meet up with these challenges to uh, meet challenges? Uh, so yes, Kano was divided into zones. Uh, because of the size of Kano and the population, uh, we, we, we divided Kano into six zones. Uh, these zones have called in workrooms that they can store um, appreciable number of vaccines in Kano, uh, so that the distance between the last mile and the source of the vaccine is much, much reduced. Uh, we also, in the LJ stores, we also had, uh, still have um, solar powered refrigerators and also in health facilities. So this improved a lot the potency uh, of the vaccine, and this uh, ensured that our vaccines are potent in uh, in car. Over. So Thank you very is... much. Go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tijani. Um, and thanks everyone. Um, there's one final question that says, what can you share with us on the community engagement strategy being practiced in Kano vis-a-vis um, -vis the FOTA tracking reconciliation meeting, et cetera? Um, Liz, do we have time to answer that question or would we need to get back to Atahir um, via email or send him the community engagement strategy documents offline? No, you can go ahead and answer that question. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Tijani or Lucky, do you want to um, answer that? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have a CE strategy where um, every ward has a Nyangwa that the organizers have a position with. It. So for this CE uh, this Nyangwa, we have uh, like listing of all uh, under one children in the environment in the ward, and they follow them up. Either some, some places weekly, some places um, uh, maybe twice weekly. There are also the ward uh, the volunteers, which uh, will work with the uh, mayor and go into this um, communities to ensure that everyone that uh, has been like listed is followed up to know if uh, they have been vaccinated as expected or not. So. Uh, this is all being tracked in the community to ensure every single um, child in the community is vaccinated and tracked as possible. Additionally, I think the health workers also have their own list of patients when they come for the situation meetings and identify the ones that have not been able to have not been vaccinated. So it's more of um, the link between the health workers, the community, volunteers, and uh, 
Nihang was. So everyone is in the loop to do this. Over. Thanks, Lucky. Um, and I think to add to that, um, yes, Atahe, we will share the community engagement document with you. Um, but the strategy is essentially using traditional leaders to um, identify or get a line list of a per child information of all of the children eligible for vaccination, and then use that in collaboration with the facility to identify children and get them vaccinated, track defaulters, um, et cetera. Um, also, that strategy has a community resource person component and also links with CHMIS and a number of other strategies um, that currently exist. And we'll, we will share that document with you. If you can please drop your email address in the chat, that would be great. Um, back to you, Liz. Great. Thanks so much and appreciate you answering all those questions. Um, I just have a few slides to close us out. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so if you still have any questions remaining or things that you think of later, um, feel free to join us on the Boost Community platform. So boostcommunity.org. Uh, we do have a special learning group that is dedicated to Bright Spots. Um, so feel free to post um, your questions there. Um, also, um, we would really appreciate if you took our post uh, session survey, um, just so that we can improve in the series. Um, I think all of those links have been shared in the chat. Um, and then I just wanted to share a few other opportunities that we have coming up um, on the Boost platform. Um, so one is uh, a session on responsive feedback and approach to maximizing impact through testing and learning. Um, we're going to have an info session that will be led by uh, the, the CURVE team, which will introduce this concept of responsive feedback and its benefits. And that's coming up uh, next Tuesday um, at 1 p.m. GMT. Um, so this interactive webinar will explore this approach, um, which can help to ensure that immunization professionals become more agile by learning from and acting on the latest key evidence on specific topics, uh, such as vaccine hesitancy. Um, we're actually going to be launching um, a course uh, later this fall. So this is to kick off um, kind of the topic and uh, gather interest from the community. Um, so we'll post the registration link in the chat, but would encourage you all to attend if you're interested. Um, we also launched a, a new series earlier this summer uh, called Sparks. Um, so this uh, is in the same vein of Bright Spots. Uh, but really is pointing out kind of specific components of an immunization program that has been successful. Um, it might include programs that are still currently running, but just um, lessons learned that members would like to share with the community. Um, so we'll also post some more information there, but feel free to submit um, your spark if you have anything to share with the community. Um, I think with that, I just want to thank um, the whole SIDAR team for a wonderful presentation today um, and also for their time answering your great questions uh, towards the end of the session. Um, I might hand it back over to the team if they want to share any other final words uh, for today. None from my end. Thank you, everyone, for very engaging conversations. And bye from me. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.